Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to CSIS. I'm Seth Center. I'm the director of the Project on History and Strategy. We're thrilled to have everybody joining us today for a terrific discussion on women in the history of statecraft. Um, we're joined by Susie Colburn, a postdoc at SAIS, uh, Sarah Castro, an associate professor at the Air Force Academy and former uh, member of the intelligence community, and Fiona Hill, a uh, senior fellow at Brookings Institution, along with my colleague at CSIS, uh, Emma Bates. Um, I just want to make a couple points at the on, at the outset. Uh, first of all, I'm really thrilled to have, be joined by such terrific scholars and, and um, former uh, government officials and, and a terrific uh, colleague in Emma. Um, there are two big two big ideas I think that are driving my motivation for helping to support this project. And one is I really want to stress that there's a meaningful connection between scholarship and public service. I think they're fully compatible with one another and actually are necessary complements. Uh, good scholars inform good policy and ideally policy experienced and, and can help inform good scholarship. But I think more importantly than that, a sense of history is really vital to the integrity of public service. And I think the experience of the essays and, and the women who are participating in this project make that clear sense of history uh, creates a real appreciation for the responsibility uh, in those who wield power. And certainly uh, Fiona has lived this experience. I think it's important to inculcate that sense of integrity through teaching uh, like Susie has done uh, and Sarah as well, both to uh, students and to those who are in the profession of arms. And I think History is also vital to transparency and integrity in a democracy. Uh, Elizabeth Charles, who's one of our participants, works at the State Department Historian's Office and dedicates her professional life to making sure that transparency and history work in service of democracy. And then, of course, history is vital to the quality and rigor of policy analysis, um, which is true whether you're at RAND or in the government or working outside of the government. And so I just have a real gratitude for the women who are willing to participate and share their experiences as scholars and intellectuals and public servants. Uh, they're ter terrific role models. Um, their experiences really demonstrate pathways uh, for success for young people. And that takes me to Emma, who is the true visionary uh, behind this project. She is both smarter than me, younger than me, and more insightful than me. And so she gets all credit for recognizing this important need and translating the project into action. And so I just thank you, Emma, for this terrific, uh, terrific vision and over to you. Thank you, Seth. Um, so I wanna welcome our three uh, scholars, um, uh, Susan, uh, or Susie, Sarah, and Fiona. Um, and just as a reminder to all of our attendees, uh, there is a question and answer function at the bottom that you can type in your questions as we go, and I will make sure to incorporate as many of those as we have time for. So, first of all, um, the three of you are exceptional scholars, regardless of the other elements of your identity. So, tell us a little bit about your expertise, your research interests, and um, the projects that you're working on now uh, or are looking forward to working on soon. Um, I'll start with Fiona and then move to Sarah and then Susan. Well, thanks very much, Emma, and also Seth. And it's really great to be here. And I'm delighted to be here uh, with Susie and Sarah as well. Um, this is a great opportunity uh, for me, you know, like everyone else, to uh, learn from others about what they're working on and also to sort of share uh, some of our common experiences and. Um, some of the things that, um, you know, perhaps are slightly unique to us. Um, in my case, um, my research over the years has primarily focused on Russia um, and the former Soviet Union. You know, I started off actually um, studying history when the Soviet Union uh, was actually still uh, with us, um, as rather than receding very quickly into the rear view mirror. Um, my first part of my uh, degree was in Soviet studies, and then the Soviet Union 
collapsed almost immediately afterwards. So I had a sort of defunct degree <laughs> within about six months of uh, receiving it as a, a master's student and um, quickly pivoted to history um, for uh, the PhD. Um, and um, in any case, uh, since then, over the last uh, several decades, I've focused primarily on uh, Russian history, but also delved into work on the Caucasus, Central Asia and uh, many of the other um, regions. I'm working actually now on um, a project that puts um, together much of the work that I uh, have done in the past several decades, but in the frame of a personal narrative. Because a lot of my study of history has been driven by questions I posed myself, dating back to childhood, about why certain things happened. And I think you know that fits in with what Seth was saying about the importance of history. History helps to inform us about the problems and the circumstances of the present. And I've spent a lot of time since 2016 reflecting on you know, how we got to a situation here in the United States where we ended up with a, a populist uh, president. And over the last several years, um, you know, increasing threats to our democratic institutions, both from the inside um, as well as outside, and as a result of the Russian um, intervention in the 2016 presidential election. And so I've actually started to uh, uh, work on a book, which is um, uh, after turning the uh, first draft of the manuscript by the end of January. So I have to keep uh, moving this um, pretty quickly, that puts uh, together our present in the context of, uh, of a larger past and bringing in um, observations uh, from my own uh, childhood and uh, personal professional experiences in the United Kingdom, as well as my observations from the collapse of the Soviet Union, all the work that I've done over the last decades, uh, along with more of a sort of a contemporary history and perspective on the United States. And I'm looking at the crisis of deindustrialization, de the loss of educational and other job and life opportunities in the United States successively over the last uh, 20 years and uh, trying to you know, kind of figure out where we go from here. So it's a uses of history project, which is something that I've been working on for a long time. And I'm being a little vague because my um, editor keeps telling me not to give away the plot too much because otherwise no one will buy the book. So that becomes a problem when you move from doing your regular history you know, projects and work at think tanks where you, know, you want to tell everybody all about it. And uh, you know, because the, you're not in a commercial um, uh, book press world. And then you know, the difference with uh, when you actually want to have people buy the book a bit later. But I'm quite excited about the project because it's um, an opportunity that I've never had before to put everything together, a sort of a kind of a meta um, history approach uh, to, uh, to the book. Thank you. Um, how about uh, Sarah next? Okay, well, first I just wanted to you know, say thank you for inviting me. Um, for all of our appearances as, you know, federal employees of the Air Force Academy, they like us to remind everybody that I'm here um, voicing my personal opinion. So I'm not representing any organization. And, and this is actually part of my gratitude to CSIS because really my only qualification for participating in this project is personal. <laughs> it, it is because, it's because of my personal identity. And so I, I really appreciate this, that you guys at CSIS recognized that this is something important to talk about. And, and I think that 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 sharing that awareness with other people in this field is so important to making the changes that have to happen with it. And, um, and progress has come when awareness is shed on this. Um, but I also noticed that in participating in this project, it required a certain level of vulnerability, right? And I, th and I think that that's maybe more true for those of us on the younger side <laughs> in, the, in the publication list. Um, because youth is also a, a, a salient identity, right, in academia. Um, so I definitely noticed that participating in this required a certain amount of vulnerability. And I think that that relates back to the idea of this is something personal, right? And so the mentor that I wrote about in my piece for, for the group of essays had a, had a real like bone to pick with the idea of thing of anything in the world not being personal. And this is part of his identity as a religious studies scholar. But he used to go on a rant about that saying about, it's not personal, it's business. <laughs> he used to go on this huge rant. And I think that this was something that really captured me when I was writing the essay, right? Um, this idea that all of it is personal. And so that is, um, that is really something that drives my work 
Um, so right now I'm working on two different projects. There is um, a book manuscript that is a very long time coming that has had to go into hibernation as I created humans and curriculum several times. It's moving back to the front burner, I'm happy to say. And that focuses on um, the birth of US intelligence and especially US intelligence officials who were embedded at the Chinese Communist Party headquarters in Yan'an from 1944 to 1947. And so this is a pretty well-known mission among people who study US-China relations, but everyone previous to me who studied it has focused on what it meant for US-China relations. And I'm actually interested in what it means for US intelligence. And especially coming at this with an idea, with an eye that I think has been heightened over the past year and in, in conjunction with my other project towards what paternalism has to do with foreign affairs, right? And I think many of the problems that we've had in the US relationship with China can be traced back to this underlying assumption that we're not dealing with equals, right? And, and I think that this comes out looking at this intelligence that this group in the 40s is generating and sending back and the reaction to it, which is something that my project does. My second project that I have going that I've just begun, and this is with support that I'm very grateful from, the Wilson Center. I'm one of their China scholars this year. And um, they've supported me to look into this new issue of nuclearization and how US intelligence officials um, followed China's nuclearization. And what I'm really finding in that project is that most of the people in the US, especially the ones who hadn't spent any time in China, didn't think that China could do it. There's an attitude uh, that doesn't, I think, exist in the Soviet nuclearization intelligence um, that th of surprise <laughs> whenever China is, achieves these technical um, achievements. And then, and then when, they, when they really actually test the bomb and that was vindicated by some intelligence analysts, you know, some, some people had predicted that, there's just real surprise by policymakers. And I, th and I think um, maybe this is a good metaphor for us to revisit right now as there's so many conversations about was engagement a mistake? And, um, and, and I, think, I think this, you know, what I'm finding suggests that maybe it wasn't, maybe engagement itself is not a problem. It's the way the US is coming at it. So, and I, and I think that there are some deep roots to that. So that's, that's what I'm looking at um, right now. And I've said more than enough. So let's, let's talk to Susan. <laughs> Uh, you've, you've sparked several of my next questions, so that's great. Um, Susie, your turn. All right, uh, let, me, let me echo Fiona and Sarah's comments and just say how wonderful it is to be here. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be a part of this project, and I think it's such an important uh, thing for us to talk about. Um, and so I am a historian of NATO, of European security and the transatlantic relationship, and most of my interests are about the Cold War as an international system, and the role that nuclear weapons play in international politics and, and society. And so currently, I'm in the final stages of finishing a book that's a history of the Euro missiles, uh, which were the intermediate range nuclear force systems that were ultimately done away with by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev in the historic December 1987 INF Treaty. And mine is a transatlantic history, which puts the North Atlantic Alliance at the center of the issue to show how it emerged out of the perennial fault lines of that transatlantic bargain dating back to NATO's founding in 1949 and the Cold War's stagnation uh, in the late 1960s and this sort of opening that was created as the Cold War stabilized and, and changed in the late 1960s where you see the rise of detente and arms control but also the erosion of US superiority in nuclear terms, but also in faltering economic power. And so I follow the Euro missile story through to the end of the Cold War, showing how that issue served as a catalyst for sort of sweeping conversations about what security looked like and how to achieve security in the atomic age. And, and in so doing, I try to shed some light on the fundamental fragility of the Atlantic Alliance during the Cold War. I think now uh, in 2020, it's really easy for us to 
think that NATO was of course going to survive the Cold War because we still have it today. And so we, we tend to project a sort of confidence about its survival backwards. But in the 1980s, that was far from certain. And some of the fundamental uh, assertions and assumptions that lay at the heart of the alliance were disintegrating both between the allies, but almost more importantly, between allied governments and their constituents. Um, and, and so, so I'm, I'm wrapping that up and then I'm starting to think ahead to two projects that are in, in many ways uh, a logical outgrowth of that work. I have some unanswered questions that don't fit in a 100,000 word book manuscript uh, and that I'd like to build on, on more. So the first is a project really thinking about how we apply the lessons of history and how policymakers have used the lessons of history but using historical cases as a, a sort of laboratory. And so I'm particularly interested in how policymakers across the Atlantic Alliance used and abused the analogy that Germany might sign another Rapallo or Molotov-Ribbentrop deal and be lured in, sort of seduced by Moscow uh, throughout the Cold War. Uh, and the second is really coming back to a question Sarah raised actually about the terms on which we engage in interstate competition and in the international order. And so I'm, I'm just starting to think about a project that would be a sort of intellectual history of detente in the West throughout the Cold War. Um, thank you, Susie, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so it, the, one of the common themes across a lot of the essays that particularly showed up in, in their interview with Fiona um, was the idea of, uh, it seems like a simple idea, but of asking the right questions or asking new questions, right? Um, and it strikes me that just now, you know, when Sarah was, was talking about her project, looking at the impact of paternalism on our relationship, on our diplomatic relationship with China, you know, it takes somebody, you know, today to ask that question, right? And yet it's a question about something that has been studied in countless books. So um, each of you kind of, how do you think about the dilemma between studying something that seems very played out, right? It seems like everybody has been studying military and diplomatic history and finding ways to ask those new questions in a way that, you know, it, it, and reassure yourself that it's a question worth asking, even though nobody has asked it before. Um, I'll start with Fiona. Well, no, thanks very much for that, Emma. I mean, that's um, a really important point of your starting point. And, you know, I was just wrote into the chat as I was listening to Susie, that Susie's very question uh, that she's um, exploring right now about NATO and uh, the um, uh, whole arms uh, discussions and the Euro missile crisis of the 1980s is exactly why I started studying Russian by posing a question or I think having a question posed to me by um, one of my elderly relatives who had um, been um, in the uh, Atlantic and Arctic convoys during World War II helping to supply the Soviet Union where we were wartime allies about why was it that the Soviet Union now wanted to blow us up? You know, how precisely that disconnect between the government and the constituencies and where I was growing up in England, kind of feeling we were going to be ground zero in the event of any nuclear exchange and that, you know, nobody was ever consulting us or asking us any questions. And this was the whole period where many people became active in the campaign for nuclear disarmament, including many of the Germans who today um, feeding into the other part of um, uh, Susie's analysis are in the government around Angela Merkel and who had to be consulted during the US decision to withdraw from the INF. Uh, and they'd themselves uh, uh, become political activists in Germany, in the Western part of Germany, and sometimes also in East Germany, Angela Merkel herself and the, uh, the, during that you know, period of uh, German division, uh, also activated by the SS-20 Pershing missile crisis and starting to think about their own role in European security and was NATO really the solution you know, to many of these dilemmas when decisions might be made by the United States as really the dominant power and without the full consultation of other allied governments and certainly not their um, allied populations. And that propelled a lot of people into politics. In my case, it propelled me towards trying to study Russian and to ask this question 
a question that obviously you know had been um posed many times before about what was the sources of enmity between the Soviet Union and NATO and the West um, after uh, the breakup of the alliance after the end of World War II. But, you know, from the vantage point uh, that I um, was starting on this, um, I didn't have the answers. And I think this is the whole point. It's the vantage point to where you are, how you look at that question and how you look at the unfolding um, of, of events. Because so many times, um, as both um, Sarah and Susie are pointing out, the questions have been asked by men at the top. And often, you know, people in um, uh, you know very um, senior positions in uh, security space who often take um, a lot of the issues for granted, and have not really examined and looked at them. And over the last several years um, of the Trump administration, we've actually been forced to ask questions over and over again of ourselves that we haven't uh, posed before or haven't really been posed from a particular vantage point. So I think that that is um, really the essence of uh, what you're trying to get at here, Emma. Just because you know a question um, has been posed before doesn't mean that it's been framed in the same way, and it's been you know asked by somebody sitting in a very different place. And when I was um, you know a much younger scholar in the 1990s, I worked very closely with Graham Allison. I was one of his research uh, staff. And of course, you know, he uh, did all of that work on the Cuban Missile Crisis that came out of his own uh, thesis, a PhD thesis in the government department at Harvard, but it was really a historical project, re-examining again the um, way that the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis unfolded. I remember one of his great conclusions is, you know, what you, uh, where you sit is what you see and what you conclude. In other words, your role and position in a particular set of events really determines what you see what, and, and, and what you conclude. So each one of us have a very different perspective to bring here. And it's uh, part, as um, uh, Sarah was pointing out, of our own unique identity. And so I think every individual has something new to bring to any question uh, and any issue. Yeah, and, and I want to pose kind of the same question to Sarah, um, just, but highlighting kind of the insight that uh, you know, it's, it strikes me that the research that you're doing, Sarah, is, is it is literally, it is teaching us how to do diplomacy better by looking at diplomacy that has been done before, which, you know, it, it, the context that makes that actually kind of seem revolutionary is it, not all of our attendees might realize that military and diplomatic history has sort of fallen out of vogue. Um, it's, it, it feels to a lot of the kind of cool, woke feminist um, scholars of today that, you know, it's really time to study the things that haven't been studied quite so much. And so I'll add to the question, how did you, how did you make the, how did you thread that needle? You know, you found a really cool way to learn something from the diplomacy of the past that, yes, was conducted by old white guys, right? Um, and yet you're looking at it in a way that they never would have. Just tell us a little about how you came to that point. So a lot of a lot of what Dr. Hill was saying really resonated with me. I have a lot of similarity in my answer to this question to what she was saying. But I think one of the things that I would emphasize is public service, right? So my career, I've kind of dipped in and out of public service throughout the time. And so exposure to the questions that are driving policymakers now is very influential in my work. And in, and in fact, um, it was mostly old white men who were asking me this question when I was an analyst at CIA, but I was a leadership analyst at CIA. So I looked at Chinese leaders and I was constantly briefing American officials who were going to meet Chinese leaders or who were working on Chinese issues about leadership intentions, right? And so one of the questions that I got in almost every briefing was, why are they still communist? Are they still communist? To what extent have they drunk the Kool-Aid? <laughs> what is this all about? And that was not a project that I could wrap my arms around as an analyst in the IC. Like that, that is just not the kind of projects that most of us can, can take on. Um, so that's really what pushed me back toward uh, academic study is is trying to get a grip on that question be, because policymakers want and need to, to know the answer to that right um, and and so that was a very direct 
public service connection, I guess, for me and understanding what the policy world is doing. And, um, and, and, you know, and I think this issue of where you sit is really important, right? So I was noticing that um, my friend and mentor and hero, fellow spy historian, Sarah Jane Cork, who's also in the anthology, um, talked about being able to push, push boundaries in the field, price, because you're not part of the mainstream, right? So you, you can't be subject to groupthink if you're not part of the group, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, and I think that that is one of the things that um, is why it's so important to get more women and more diverse voices revisiting this old stuff. Because the truth of it is, history is always about us revisiting old stuff. That's the whole point of it. It's always someone come, you know, if it wasn't that, why is there still a field of classical studies, right? Why, you know, haven't we asked all the questions about that by now? No, because it's constantly a reinterpretation of old stuff to make it meaningful to today and to learn lessons from it, right? Um, and so the, the more people that we get under that tent doing that from different perspectives, I think the better and more useful it'll be. Did I answer all of the questions? I think so. Okay. Um, I'll I'll add as I as I turn to Susie, you know that we often focus for women in whatever women in science, women in math, women in we often focus on the external barriers like prejudice or discrimination or or harassment or um, you know quotas and things like that that, that make their appearance in these essays. Um, in this publication, but there are also these internal barriers, right? Um, for in my own case, it took me a very long time. You know, I kind of late in my educational career to realize that I didn't need personal military or diplomatic experience. I didn't need a detailed vocabulary of the systems of, you know, war and diplomacy in order to assess policy and have an opinion about it that was worth something. Um, so maybe as I as I turn to Susie. And then you guys feel free to jump in as well. We can kind of, you know, open up into more relaxed discussion. Tell us a little bit about any moments in your life that you had a similar realization that, oh wait, <laughs> I don't need to be 110% qualified to think about these, the details of this, um, you know, jargony topic in order to have an interesting uh, thing to contribute. Yeah, it's, it's a really great question uh, and something that I think deters a lot of a lot of people from from engaging with really, really difficult uh, and ar sometimes arcane topics. I know that when I started working on arms control issues and deployment questions, I mean, when you're getting the lay of the land on missile ranges and throw weights and like there's a lot of terminology there. But some of it is about trusting yourself, right? Knowing that you have the skills and that you can do the work, right? That you can do the research. And there is so much out there for you to teach yourself. And, and I have found just an incredibly generous community of scholars who have helped to make that possible. I had the good fortune when I was in graduate school to do a program run through the Wilson Center of the Nuclear Proliferation International History Projects Boot Camp. Um, which despite its ominous name is not teaching you how to make nuclear weapons, but how to study them. Uh, and, and that community has continually been an incredible resource uh, because I've just known so many people who have been working on, on related issues. Uh, so, and I think that that maybe speaks to a broader question about why I think it's so valuable to talk about the makeup of who studies these questions because having a network of people who can support you is so critical, right? I mean, we often think of scholarly work and especially historical work as somehow a, a, an individual enterprise, right? We see one person's name on the front of a book and we think that only one person has somehow played a role in the creation of that work and that's never true. I mean, one of my favorite things to do is to read the acknowledgements of books for exactly this reason, because you start to see just how deep these networks run and they're intergenerational and cross continental and and it's it's really a testament to just how much this is a group enterprise. Um, the only other thing I would add 
is on this question of, of revisiting old questions. Uh, I think that we tend sometimes in academic circles to place a lot of emphasis on the newness of questions, but we're all still interested in the old questions. And we, we regularly return to questions that have been asked before because they still offer something explanatory to the world that we live in. And that world is constantly changing. And, and as much as historians often try to pretend that uh, they're aloof from the present, the present is undoubtedly shaping the way that you're thinking about the past. I mean, I think about working on NATO and certainly the, uh, you know, this sort of uncertainty and questioning about the Alliance's future now has made me rethink episodes in the past. Uh, in the process of writing this book, we left the INF Treaty, and that was really something that also made me rethink uh, a lot of the episodes that I was discussing in this book. And so, you know, you cannot escape the, the times in which you live and retreat solely into the past as much as you, you may want. And so one of the biggest things for me that, that really pushed me towards writing this big overview book was not that there's a lack of excellent literature on the Euro missiles, but that I wanted a younger generation who hadn't lived through it to be able to understand the stakes of that issue, to have a sort of one-stop shop. So as the Cold War recedes and the logic of bipolarity is no longer readily apparent to young people, that they could pick something up and, and really get right into the heart of that issue. I wondered if I could just kind of come in on just the tale of um, what um, Susie just said there, because I know that you were going to look, Emma, into the chat, but I did notice that there was um, one question from um, Jill Bennett, um, who, um, that's why I put my glasses on to have a look about this, about, um, you know, making some of the points, but saying about whether there's so much of a difference in being a woman and, uh, and whether, um, you know, men cannot ask uh, the same questions. I think all of this ties into what Susie's um, just been saying about perspectives and about looking at things from different vantage points, particularly from different generations and, you know, different views. And Emma, you were saying yourself that there was, you know, a lot of pressure in history to kind of come up with women's history and, um, you know, kind of more, um, you know, female oriented vantage points. But I think the overarching um, point that we're all trying to make is that you need all of this together. And I've actually written a lot of my um, uh, books and projects in the past with men and with teams, you know, as, as is, um, you know, everyone's saying, you don't do this alone. A lot of this is a team effort, because in, in many respects, you're building on the work of other people in any case. And it's not like you're thinking about everything in a vacuum. You know, I think it's, um, you know, that terrible truism that everybody's already thought of everything <laughs> kind of already in the past, just, you know, it's maybe not just fully formed. And there always is some, you know, new dimension that you can bring to this. But I have felt that I've been at my most productive when I've been really working actively with other colleagues who bring different perspectives to this. And, you know, I work very closely on two books with Clifford Gaddy, an economist at um, Brookings, 20 odd years older than me, um, who'd been doing, you know, work that I found extraordinarily interesting, um, but, you know, that was not accessible to me in the same way that it was for, uh, for him, either by his training as, a, as an economist um, or by, you know, um, a factor of age and experience, uh, life experience, that is, as well as academic experience. And he felt the same way that I was bringing, you know, completely different perspectives um, to um, the same um, subjects. And in fact, both books that I worked with him on, The Siberian Curse, about the um, industrialization of S Siberia and the impacts that had on um, Russia as it tried to um, transform itself from a Soviet economy to a free market economy. That came out of a long discussion where we were offering different vantage points, the same problem in a seminar at Brookings. And the same thing happened with the book on Putin. I, like uh, Sarah, um, came out of one of my stints in government in the intelligence um, community, thinking that we'd really just not um, got into the mindset of Vladimir Putin. And, you know, this was in, um, you know, after 10 years of him being either president or prime minister, I was also, you know, looking at the leadership analysis in the same way that Sarah was and thinking that there was, how could you get a, a better handle on this, um, this guy? He's been in power for so long and yet we knew so little about him. So how about, you know, when I got back to Brookings, starting to talk to Cliff again, look at him for different vantage points. What could we bring from what we knew about him? Um, into the story and then, you know, try to look at him in a different way. 
And part of that whole personal experience, I had a eureka moment precisely just because of who I was, the timing of things. I'd been in, you know, the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, exactly when the INF um, uh, treaty was first um, signed between Gorbachev and Reagan. I'd been there for a full year. I was there during the Gorbachev Reagan summit of 1988. And in reading through all the material on Putin, I realized he wasn't there. He was in Dresden. He was in, you know, kind of in the Eastern Bloc, you know, the other side of the wall in Germany. And he was completely out of the picture for several years about the peak of perestroika and all these things happening. And it was a very optimistic time in the Soviet Union. It wasn't an optimistic time in East Germany because it was falling apart under Eric Honecker. And he had this very dark view about the collapse of the Soviet Union. It wasn't necessarily shared by everybody in um, the Soviet Union, you know, at the time um, in that run up. They saw it more as optimistic. And that gave me an insight that I would never have had under other circumstances. And that helped, you know, and Cliff had insights that I would never have had because of the period of being there in the 60s and 70s in the Soviet Union. And it was those different perspectives that I think helped us create a really good book that was informed by history, but was really about the present. So, you know, this is exactly what everyone's saying here. And so I think, you know, to Jill's point, of course, men can ask questions, but we all ask questions differently. Every single person does. If we all sat down now and picked you know, upon a topic, we'd all have a different vantage point in asking different questions. And I think that's the whole point of what we're trying to do. And especially with this program that CSIS is doing. Yeah, and we've, we've received a comment from Erica Triskari uh, that I think adds onto that really well that, um, in so many disciplines, we overlook the assumptions, right? And so the experiences you've had as a person, um, which often are influenced by your gender experience, uh, are gonna go into the questions you ask and the hypotheses. And um, as in any discipline, we really need to examine those in order to interpret the results that we get. Um, I've got a question from Katrina Ponti that, um, that I'll broaden a little bit. She asked, how can historians of pre 19th century topics make their voices heard in the world of strategy? And I'll also, I'm curious about you guys' perspective on how can people leverage what they are an expert in, in order to, um, in order to bring it to the policy world? Do you have advice on, um, you know, maybe people haven't pursued something that is specifically about statecraft, but they are now interested in it and they want to learn more. Um, but perhaps, you know, I mean, pre 19th century is a good example. Um, what would advice would you give to people who have specialized a little outside but find this interesting? Any of you? <laughs> Well, I can, I can certainly jump in on this, um, you know, from the perspective of um, European security, and I'm sure that um, Susie and Sarah can say the same thing, because an awful lot of the institutions and the outlooks and perspectives that we, we kind of see in contemporary politics are shaped by the deep past. There are, you know, very persistent patterns in political culture. And, you know, there's an awful lot of literature out there on continuity and change in, um, in world affairs. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, many people, um, even in contemporary politics, refer back, um, you know, to early modern uh, times. I mean, in the, particularly, you know, if you're studying um, any of the major European countries, you have to, in many respects, be very well aware of how their legal systems emerged um, and took shape, you know, the histories of conflict uh, among and between uh, countries. Um, you know, the sort of imperial patterns, you know, everything from Spain and Portugal and the United Kingdom, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. There's an awful lot there under those particulars of, um, you know, social organization that really do also inform the evolution of the political systems over time. And of course, you know, I mean, Sarah will attest, you know, often when people are being, you know, sent out our diplomats or senior officials to, you know, somewhere um, for, you know, meetings, they're often given a kind of potted history, <laughs> you know, of, of key issues that will be very relevant for some of the topics that they're, that they're discussing. You know, so you can't, you know, show up in France uh, when, the, you know, Macron, who makes frequent comparisons uh, between himself and Napoleon or, you know, even the kind of the Jupiterian idea of, you know, the kind of the French uh, monarchs, you know, without knowing um, something about, you know, modern and early modern uh, French history, for example. 
I have a couple of ideas on this one. Um, so one of the things that they used to teach us in writing at CIA was about finding a current hook. And especially if you wanted to tell a story that was historical, you, you wanted to make sure that you found what they called a current hook. And so this is something that you can definitely do, even, even if you're working pre 19th century, find the way the you know, the, the part of the policy conversation that the thing that you're studying relates to and point that out. Don't make readers make the connection, right? So put it right in, in your paper. So that's one thing that I think that you can do. Um, you know, a, sec a second bit of advice would be to get involved. So get involved in small and big ways. So participate in panels like this and ask questions. Um, be on Twitter and um, respond there. You know, fo follow what the conversation is and participate. Bring your ideas into that. And, and then the third bit of advice that I would have on this, having seen policymakers and, and how their brains work kind of close up for a while, don't get discouraged if your impact is not first degree and directly obvious, right? So things trickle up to policymakers. Policymakers hardly ever have time to read books. They rarely read scholarly articles. Um, and this is, you know, a generalization, but in general, people working for them read these things and, and interpret the ideas and put them in bite-sized pieces that then trickle up to the policymakers. So it, you know, it's a very indirect, diffuse kind of influence that you have. And just being sensitized to the fact that you're asking questions that had to do with strategy, trying to inject a current hook into it when you can, that's enough. That's enough. You, you, know, you end up making an influence just by participating in the discourse. I think I would just add that policymakers aren't the only place that you might shape the policy conversation, right? So that's one avenue. And when academics talk about bridging the gap between policy between policy and academia, that's often a place that they emphasize. But you know, teaching is a great way in the classroom, with your family, with your neighbors, in your local newspaper. All of these places are places that you can shape a conversation that is ultimately about policy, right? Every one of us thinks about issues in our world and decides whether we care about them, that we want to read more about them, that we want to vote for candidates who have certain opinions or not. And so I think there's that just means that there's so many more potential avenues for uh, us all to think about being engaged in a conversation and leveraging our particular skills. I think the other thing I will say on the subject matter question is that you should study what you want to study. And if it's if it's interesting to you, you will find connections. And sometimes they won't be obvious when you start, right? I was saying earlier about how things change and circumstances change. I didn't think that I would go to CSIS and talk about uh, the death of the INF Treaty when I started this book, but I did. Uh, I mean, right? This, events change as you're working, especially when it takes a long time to write a book. And so you never know about the opportunities that might open up, but there are so many perennial dilemmas and questions that are at the very heart of strategy. I mean, there's a reason why people are still talking about whether Thucydides is relevant. If Thucydides is still around, there's a whole bunch of things in the centuries in between that are also still relevant. Um, I'm going to turn to an interesting question from Erin Connolly, um, and and there's a boring version of the quest, this question that is asked often, which is, if women ran the world, wouldn't we all just be so much better off, right? But what she asks is, is I think, more interesting, and you, you guys might have some thoughts. How has the male-dominated narrative of what security is, how has that affected the way we pursue security as a nation, um, or you know, the way that nations tend to pursue security? And, you know, what do you, what do you think about, you know, as the new generation of women come up into leadership, how might that shift a little bit? Um, and, you know, it's, it's a bit of more of a philosophical question, but I, I liked it, so. <laughs> I, I can jump in on this one. So, and, and I think that I talk a little bit about this in my essay. 
Um, so I think part of the change is happening generationally, you know, and I think um, there's this quote that people trot out about Ginger Rogers and, um, and that she did everything Fred Astaire did, but she did it backward in high heels. You guys know this one? And sometimes this is attributed to her as a quote, and it's not a quote. Um, actually, this idea came about in a cartoon in the 80s. And so this speaks to the issue of like awareness of these imbalances and being able to, to talk about your identity, right? So for Ginger Rogers to make this quote would have been pretty hard because this was just the water she swam in. <laughs> and in fact, this comes out in the 80s because we're starting to recognize that's kind of unfair. Right. And so a lot of people that are sort of the generation ahead of me, or maybe two, um, have brought this out to be like, this is what I do. I, you know, I dance, I do everything he does, but backward in high heels. And in fact, I think Hillary Clinton even used this quote in her, in one of her speeches in like the 2016 campaign. Right. But so for my generation, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to do what he does backward in high heels. I want to do what I want to do, you know? And so some of, um, I think a lot of women authors and people writing about feminism right now have used this phrase, taking up your own space, taking up your own space. And I think that that captures it a little bit better for people in my generation, maybe people coming up. The idea that um, you, you can have your own perspective and defend it instead of having to, to follow right along with what has been done before. I think a new space is opening up for that. I think we have to work really hard to protect it, <laughs> right? And to, to, and to nurture that. Um, and I think that some of, some of what us write about in the essay collection about gatekeepers and even other women that are preventing us from doing it this way, that's dangerous. And we need to, we need to move beyond that, right? And, um, and so I think the more that this kind of work gradually happens, everyone taking up our own space. And I think that this is an idea that has come up more in a conversation among white women, discourse among white women, right? It's a lot, I have the privilege of taking up my own space if I was a black woman, maybe I wouldn't have the same privilege. If I was uh, an American Indian man, maybe I wouldn't feel the same privilege. So I think we have an obligation to take up our own space when we have that privilege. And it's gonna put enough pressure on this idea of a male-centered or a, a paternalist idea of security that that will start to, um, tensions will start to be obvious, right? So that's my sort of abstract perspective on it. I just have an additional thought to um, what um, Sarah has said here, and I'm sure Susie's got some perspectives as well. I think we also have to be very careful um, on this point about, you know, having too much of a focus on whether you're men or women, because Sarah already, you know, started to pass that out on racial um, terms as well. But there's also all kinds of diversity of other backgrounds. I came from poor, low income background. And where I came from, it was predominantly white. So there wasn't any racial disparities or other things to fall back on. And that perspective, the likelihood of someone like me to get into um, any kind of college is minimal. In fact, it's part of the book work that I'm looking at now. White low income boys in the United Kingdom, only 3% are likely to um, end up um, in any kind of um, higher education at an elite university. And for women, it's not much um, higher than that. So that means that those voices are completely and utterly absent in um, any academic setting. And that, you know, we, we're seeing now, this is kind of why I've been trying to unpack the threats to democracy, the rise of populism, because many people, it's not just a question of your gender or your racial or sexual or any other identity, but, um, you know, income and, you know, kind of inequality and other kind of disparities creates all kinds of different perspectives. It's very hard work being poor and you're not part of the national conversation. And as a result, you feel, you know, certain senses of alienation and, you know, often, you know, lash out 
uh, some people do, you know, in, in other uh, perspectives as well. So we've got to find a way of creating um, a space, you know, kind of in which lots of people are included. And I worry a lot uh, that, you know, as we separate ourselves out according to gender or then, you know, start to divide out even further on racial or sexual identity or other issues, that we're, we're really losing a lot of the other perspectives that people, everybody has multiple identities. I mean, I wasn't you know particularly thinking when I was growing up about necessarily being a girl and being you know kind of held back particularly by gender at first I was held back by economic circumstances and I think we have to try to figure out how we create kind of cross group coalitions in a way even when it comes to um, acad academic um, issues and history how do you tell everybody's history how do you give everybody part of being a narrative, uh, being part of a narrative? And I thought that some of the things that, um, you know, Sarah, you were referring to um, in terms of the pre-19th century history question, there's a kind of a, a role for public history. And, you know, Susie was saying the same thing of going out and teaching history. Um, adult education, you know, continuous learning, you know, getting out there to public libraries um, and, you know, kind of schools and all kinds of other settings in town halls, talking about history, talking about the story of all of us, you know, how we all got to, to where we are. And I, and I do worry again, I think that's one of the biggest problems that faces the United States at this moment and also the UK when I came from is a total lack of a shared narrative where people can't see themselves reflected in the things that um, everyone's talking about. And again, if you only have 3%, and I think it's very similar in the United States as well, I was actually just checking that today before I started you know, onto this call, 3% of white working class males in any kind of elite education that's a very large swathe of a population. It was completely left out of any discussion. And for white working class women, you know, it's a, it's a bit better, you know, because women have been, you know, performing better in school over time. But, you know, we have a situation in many respects now where we've done so much work to help minorities and women count as minorities, you know, to gain education uh, and to uh, gain access to higher education that we've kind of forgot that there are other people who've been left behind. So this is a kind of, it's a difficult thing to talk about, but, you know, it's something that in this perspective, as we think about women having been excluded as a category, you know, for so long, about how now do we try to kind of push to get every voice reflected in somewhere as kind of part of this larger discussion. Yeah, if I could just build on that to think about the mechanics of maybe how we would write history, I think there's a there's a, a place to create space in that process too. And so if we think about this question of security being uh, often associated with uh, paternalist structures or defined by men because white men were who were in positions of power or, or tend to be what, who we deeply associate with positions of power. I think there are many ways that we could diversify it by this, right? But I think the field sort of suffers from the assumption that uh, diplomatic history is like pale male and Yale. That's the often the American trope. Uh, and so, so there are many different ways we could think about broadening. One is thinking about diplomatic history is not just something that happened in Western countries, right? There's a rich diplomatic history that's global in scope. Uh, and so thinking about putting, uh, you know, about where you draw your cases from. Uh, there's been a robust conversation in political science about this, about bringing in uh, cases from East Asia, from Africa, when you think about teaching a survey in international relations. Um, in my own work, I, I've tried to really think about where a conversation about security is taking place and to put policymakers and anti-nuclear activists and peace campaigners in conversation with one another because they shared the same ideas, the same anxieties about nuclear weapons, about the Cold War. And so security was not something that only policymakers or intelligence analysts or defense strategists were thinking about. It was a, a much broader uh, conversation. And, and on this question of, of women uh, and, and whether you know, the, the elevation of women into positions of power is is you know, the silver bullet maybe. Uh, I, I offer only an excellent historical anecdote, which is that in the early 1980s, uh, as NATO was deliberating uh, and planning to deploy the Griffins and Pershing Twos to Western Europe, the women who protested at Greenham Common, one of the most famous anti-nuclear campaigns in the United Kingdom, regularly uh, poked fun at Margaret Thatcher, the prime minister, 
for her masculine tendencies and arguing that she had given into the masculine like nature of the arms race. And so these two have a history, right? There's, there's a long contested debate about whether women being in power is enough or whether that is just a perpetuation of masculine structures. So we're we're coming up on you know the the limitations the CSIS gives us for these um, for these virtual um, events. So just to end with <clears throat> a question that was asked in the kind of registration period and and that um, it's a little lighter, it's a little um, a little more fun. But the, how? Let's see who was this? Sorry. <laughs> um, I want to make sure I give credit. Uh, Marissa Bennett asked, <clears throat> and she's in the gap between undergraduate and graduate school, um, how do you maintain joy and humor while studying something that is often, you know, a little bit terrifying? I, I personally had to put down a project about climate change for a week or so because it was just, <laughs> it was affecting my, you know, my whole life. Um, how do you maintain you know kind of an identity that is or not identity how do you maintain uh your own kind of emotional health in in this context that we're living in in 2020 and in studying these things that are frankly you know often terrifying um or is that a you know is that a question that one would never ask a man and so we shouldn't ask it of you <laughs> thoughts are gonna get us. I think you have to be able to compartmentalize. And I think, um, you, you know, for, for me, my work is motivated by a sense of hope, right? Like if we, if we can look backward and, and find some insight that will help us get out of this mess, that's a hopeful, <laughs> that's a hopeful enterprise, right? And so even if you're dwelling in things that are very bad, if it's coming from a place of untangling that so you can figure out how it worked and prevent it. I think, I think that's what helps me compartmentalize that and, and family and hobbies, right? You have, you have to be able to step away, <laughs> which is something that it can be really hard, especially for women scholars. It can be really hard to find that work-life balance, but you have to, at some point, put it in a box <laughs> and, and do something different. So I think those are my two, two suggestions. Yeah, I, I'd like to just sort of jump in here because there was a question um, uh, from um, someone with the iPhone um, here um, about, you know, kind of the risks to women in particular right now, you know, with COVID and people being pushed out of uh, the workforce, you know, including the um, academic workforce because of the, the difficulties of um, just getting that work-life balance that Sarah has said. And I think that then it's incumbent on people like me, to be honest, um, who are older, um, although, you know, I still have a teenage uh, daughter, I'm not in the same position as I would have been much earlier on in my career of having to deal with those, um, you know, real crunches about whether I drop out or don't um, because of, you know, what's happening now. But we're seeing, of course, that women are bearing the brunt of COVID and the whole pandemic across the board, and particularly difficult for single uh, mothers you know, who had a, 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 a people facing job that can't commute, um, you know, by um, Wi-Fi and, you know, certainly can't access it from home and just the, you know, the terrible situation that we're facing here. And what I think could be hopeful here is this recognition that we're in, you know, because of all the lessons of history and one of those pivotal points um, in time, which is like the end of World War II. I basically feel that we're at that period now where we're not quite out of it yet but that we'll be surveying the rubble of the old system and trying to figure out how we build forward, not build back better, with no offence meant to Joe Biden and you know, some of the UK who are using this as well, but how we build forward new systems. And it's going to require you know, people who have been more advantaged to try to you know, help uh, pull up everyone else as well and to mobilise people to do something. And I think we need to kind of almost think of a kind of a Marshall Plan-like approach, a comprehensive approach for so many issues. Again, 
going back to the lessons of history of things that we did in the past and how we can adapt them to move forward. It's actually one of the reasons I want to write this book at the moment. I'm trying to pull some of these themes out. But I think that there is a lot of things that we can do. The problem is, of course, just contending with the great crushing weight of the present, you know, to, until we can get to a point where we can, we have to kind of get ourselves through this and to a point where we can, you know, build new institutions. And that might um, also affect academia of, you know, really taking, you know, we've kind of assumed that, you know, women have made, been able to make it work, um, you know, but actually COVID has shown that it's been on a, a razor, razor's edge the entire time. And so that we're going to be forced to have to think about real um, solutions and interventions here. And I think a lot of that burden, you know, should fall on people like me and, and helping to kind of create cross-generational coalitions to figure out what people really need, you know, to be able to move forward. As we wrap up, any any last pieces of advice, um, any of the questions you've seen in the chat that you'd like to that you'd like to quickly address, um, and then I, I want to make sure to be respectful of everyone's time. We can we can wrap up after that if anyone wants to jump in. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Fiona Hill, Dr. Sarah Castro, Dr. Susie Colburn, um, all truly accomplished historians, uh, and you know, for for taking the time to join us and talk about this element of your career and this um, you know topic. Um, we're getting you know lots of messages to to us that that uh, it was informative and interesting and inspiring and. Um, we will be posting the video of this on the CSIS website, along with the text of the um, of the comp essay compilation. And so we encourage all of you guys who maybe haven't read it to go through and read it. It's really very good um, and share it with your friends. Um, so thank you again. Uh, everybody have a great, you know, cold, snowy day if you're on the East Coast <laughs> and uh, stay well. Take care. Thank you so much, everyone, for doing this. And thank you very much, Emma, for absolutely wonderful emceeing. <laughs> yes, thank you. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. Bye-bye.